Our third soft chalk lesson in Unit 1, Lecture 4, deals with some extra DNA that bacteria may contain in addition to the chromosome. These are called plasmids and transposons. So looking at our bullet points for this soft chalk lesson, we see that many bacteria often contain small non-chromosomal DNA molecules called plasmids. Plasmids are not essential for normal bacterial growth, and bacteria may lose or gain them without harm, but they can provide an advantage under certain environmental conditions. Plasmids code for synthesis of a few proteins not coded for by the chromosome. Transposons, also called transposable elements or jumping genes, are small pieces of DNA that encode enzymes that enable the transposon to move from one DNA location to another. Transposons may be part, found as part of the bacterium's chromosome or in plasmids. Integrons are transposons that carry multiple gene clusters, often called gene cassettes that move as a unit from one piece of DNA to another. Horizontal gene transfer is a process in which organisms transfer genetic material to another cell that it's not its offspring. Horizontal gene transfer in, uh, is able to cause rather large scale changes in a bacterial genome. And the ability of bacteria and archaea to adapt to new environments as a part of bacterial evolution most frequently results from the acquisition of new genes through horizontal gene transfer rather than alteration of gene functions through mutations. And our detailed learning objectives for the unit exam for this soft chalk lesson describe plasmids and indicate their possible benefit to bacteria. State the function of the following, transposons, integrons, episomes, and conjugative plasmids. State the most common way plasmids are transmitted from one bacterium to another, and define horizontal gene transfer. So let's look at plasmids and transposons. Now, in addition to the chromosome, which of course is the genome of the bacterium, many bacteria often contain small non-chromosomal DNA molecules, and these are called plasmids. So we're calling them non-chromosomal to indicate they're not part of the bacterium's chromosome. They're extra bonus pieces of DNA. And they're fairly small. Plasmids usually contain between five and 100 genes. Now remember we mentioned that E. coli has about 3,500 genes in its chromosome. So these are much smaller than the chromosomal DNA between five and 100 genes. And plasmids are not essential for normal bacterial growth. Bacteria can lose or gain them without harm. So why would these things be going from one bacterium to another? Why can they gain them or lose them without harm? Well, uh, they can provide an advantage under certain environmental conditions. So if the bacterium happens to have a plasmid coding for a protein that would be of a benefit in that particular environment, that gives that organism a selective advantage. Now let's take the case of antibiotic resistance. Under normal environmental conditions, bacteria are not usually exposed to antibiotics. They would only be exposed if they were in the body as a person was taking an antibiotic, but under most conditions, they wouldn't be exposed to them. So some bacteria are able to, break, uh, are able to become resistant to antibiotics by producing an enzyme that breaks down that particular antibiotic but it would be of no use for a bacterium to have an enzyme that let's say breaks down a particular penicillin if the bacterium wasn't normally exposed to penicillin. That would be a waste of uh, materials and genetic information. But if that person winds up taking that penicillin antibiotic and the bacterium is in the body at that time, 
the ability to make an enzyme to degrade that antibiotic uh, becomes an advantage, that's the organism that survives and grows. So again, the idea there is that having the ability to become resistant to a particular antibiotic, such as making an enzyme that degrades that antibiotic, is not normally of value to a bacterium unless it's in an environment where it's exposed to that antibiotic. Then it provides a selective advantage. That's the one that can then survive and grow. Now, plasmids are small molecules of double-stranded helical non-chromosomal DNA. And in most cases, the plasmids are circular DNA, just like the chromosome is, where the two ends of the plasmid covalently bond together. Uh, but some plasmids do have linear DNA. Now, plasmids, being very small, can replicate independently of the chromosome, often faster than the chromosome. But there are some plasmids, which are called episomes, that can insert or integrate themselves into the host chromosome. And then their, regula uh, their replication is regulated by the chromosome itself. So if a plasmid inserts itself into a chromosome, uh, then it's called an episome. Now there are several ways plasmids can be transmitted from one bacterium to another. And we mentioned these methods of horizontal gene transfer on your take home exam you did that reviewed uh, molecular biology. I gave you a little section on transformation, transduction, and conjugation to introduce those terms. But remember, transformation is the transfer of DNA fragments from a dead degraded bacterium to a competent recipient bacterium. But in addition to fragments from the chromosome, plasmids can also be transmitted by uh, transformation. And remember, transduction is where a bacteriophage, a virus, carries DNA from one bacterium to another. Sometimes the capsid or head of the bacteriophage can assemble around a fragment of chromosomal DNA or assemble around a plasmid and carry that plasmid or that chromosomal DNA to another bacterium. So those are ways that plasmids are sometimes transmitted from one bacterium to another. But the most common mechanism of plasma transfer is conjugation. So remember, in conjugation, there's a transfer of DNA from a living donor bacterium to a living recipient bacteria by cell-to-cell -cell contact, or a mating pair forms. And in gram-negative bacteria, that usually involves what's called a sex pillus or conjugation pillus. And again, we'll look at all of these forms of horizontal gene transfer, transformation, transduction, and conjugation in detail in Unit 2. But we need to understand a little bit about it in this particular soft chalk lesson as it relates to plasmids. Now, some plasmids can be transmitted by cell-to-cell -cell contact, and those are the ones called conjugative plasmids. So these contain genes coding for proteins involved in conjugation, the ability to form mating pairs and transfer DNA from one bacterium to another by cell-to-cell -cell contact. And we see that illustrated in our first animation here, where we're going to see transfer of a conjugative plasmid and possibly other plasmids as well called mobilizable plasmids. Now again, we'll take that up in more detail in unit two, but this shows you how conjugative plasmids work. So in this particular animation, this is the chromosome or nucleoid, and that's not being transmitted during conjugation. What's going to be transmitted is a plasmid, and in this case, it's called a conjugative plasmid. And the reason it's a conjugative plasmid is it has some unique genes. It has TRA genes shown here in green, and these are called transfer genes. They are what allow a gram negative to make a conjugation pillus or sex pillus, and ultimately allow mating pairs to form between two bacteria for conjugation. They have another little sequence called origin of transfer genes, which we'll learn about in unit two, and that allows one strand of the plasmid to be cut so that it can be transferred to a recipient bacterium. 
So this is a conjugative plasmid because it co has genes coding for the ability to conjugate or form a mating pair. But often these plasmids have other genes associated with them shown in red here, such as antibiotic resistant genes or virulence genes that code for a toxin or something like that. So because this is a conjugative plasmid, it can make a conjugation pilus. This happens to be a gram-negative bacteria, which produce conjugation pili. And the conjugation pilus will then contact a recipient bacterium, which doesn't have a conjugative plasmid, as we see here. As the pilus depolymerizes and retracts, it pulls the two bacteria together. And then the TRA genes code for some coupling proteins that allow a mating pair to form and form actually a pore between the two bacteria. So that's the cell-to-cell -cell contact we mentioned in conjugation. And now a nuclease is going to cut one strand of the conjugative plasmid where these gray origin of transfer genes are. And one strand of the plasmid is transmitted into the recipient bacterium the complementary strand remains behind in the donor bacteria. At that point, each strand makes a complementary copy of itself by complementary base pairing, adenine pairing with thymine, guanine with cytosine, of course. And so when we're done, both bacteria now have that conjugative plasmid, and both bacteria are now able to conjugate because they have a conjugative plasmid. And both bacteria now carry whatever these red genes coded for in the original bacterium, such as maybe antibiotic resistance or virulence factor. And sometimes the ability to have a conjugative plasmid also allows other plasmids to be transmitted. Uh, we'll learn more about this in unit two, but they're called mobilizable pl plasmids. So note this bacterium has a conjugative plasmid that has the TRA genes in green that allow it to, to form a sex pilus and form a mating pair. But it's also carrying a different plasmid that doesn't code for conjugation. But because this plasmid on the left with the red genes codes for mating pair formation, once the two bacteria join together, another plasmid can be cut with a nuclease and transmitted into the recipient. Now normally that wouldn't be transferred from one bacterium to another because it doesn't code for mating pair formation. But as long as there's one plasmid coding for mating pair formation, other plasmids can also be transmitted during that time. And then as one strand enters, one strand stays behind, they both make complementary copies of themselves. So in this case, the recipient has the mobilizable plasmid but it can't conjugate because it didn't, uh, in this illustration, transfer a conjugative plasmid. Now, it is possible that both of those plasmids could be co-transferred also during this process. So, functions of plasmids. Well, uh, they are DNA. We know that DNA codes for protein synthesis. In this case, plasmids code for synthesis of a few proteins not coded for by the bacterial chromosome. And one of the examples I gave you on your take-home review exam for molecular genetics uh, was R plasmids found in many gram-negative bacteria that have genes coding for both production of a conjugation pilus and mating pair formation, as well as genes coding for multiple antibiotic resistance. And so this transfer mechanism is the same we looked at on the previous page, except now the red genes represent antibiotic resistant genes, so this would be an R plasmid. But again, this would allow the bacterium to conjugate with another bacterium because of the TRA genes. Uh, and these TRA genes, again, code for the ability to make a mating pair, such as the formation of a conjugation pilus and the various proteins needed for mating pair formation. So when, again, if this bacterium has an R plasmid, uh, that's a conjugative plasmid, so it can conjugate. Once that contacts a recipient, then the pilus retracts, 
and the TRA genes coding for coupling proteins that form a mating pair. One strand of the R plasmid is cut at the gray section here. The origin of transfer by a nuclease and that strand enters a recipient. The complementary strand remains behind. Both strands now make a complementary copy of themselves by normal complementary base pairing. And when we're done, both bacteria now have R plasmids. Both bacteria can now conjugate and both bacteria are now multiple antibiotic resistant because of those red antibiotic resistant genes. Now transposons are also known as transposable elements or very commonly they're called jumping genes because they're genes that jump from one DNA location to another. So these are small pieces of DNA that encode enzymes that transpose the transposon. That is, they move it from one DNA location to another, either on the same molecule of DNA or into a different molecule of DNA. So some transposons are part of the bacterium's chromosome. Other transposons are found in plasmids. And they're pretty small. They're typically between one and 12 genes long. So typically smaller than a plasmid uh, and uh, much smaller, of course, than the chromosome, which has uh, typically over 3,000 genes. Now, often that transposon also contains a number of genes coding for antibiotic resistance or maybe other traits, uh, like the ability to produce a toxin or something like that. But those genes that are coding for antibiotic resistant or some other similar trait are flanked at both ends by insertion sequences coding for an enzyme called transpoase, the enzyme for transposition. So transpoase is an enzyme that catalyzes the cutting and resealing of DNA during transposition. In other words, they allow the transposin to cut itself out of say a chromosome or a plasmid and insert into another chromosome or plasmid. And in the process, they can contribute to transmission of the other genes they're containing, such as antibiotic resistant genes. Now, some of the transposons that are typically part of the chromosome are called conjugative transposons. And when they cut themselves out of the chromosome, they also cut out several genes that code for the ability to form a mating pair and hence conjugate with other bacteria. So these are transposons that uh, carry the transposon, but also temporarily they contain genes that code for mating pair formation. So they can be allowed the transposon to be transmitted from one bacterium to another by the process of conjugation. And this animation shows you how these transposons are able to cut out and jump from one location to another. At the beginning here, uh, this transposon is in a plasmid. So if that plasmid were to enter a bacterium, it could jump or cut out of the plasmid and insert into the chromosome. Or in the case of a transposon that's in a chromosome, it can cut out of that location and reinsert itself at a different location. Some of the chromosomal transposons can make a copy of themselves, and then the copy can cut into another piece of DNA, like we see in red here. Or a transposon may cut out of a chromosome and insert into a plasmid. Or finally, they can cut out of one plasmid and insert into another plasmid. So that's why they're often called jumping genes or transposable elements. They're able to uh, cut themselves out of one location in DNA and insert into a different location in the same or a different DNA molecule. And again, some of these transposons, when they cut out, also contain genes that allow for conjugation, in which case we call them conjugative transposons.
Now, plasmids can change over time and they can actually acquire a number of different antibiotic resistance genes by means of integrons. So integrons are transposons that can carry multiple gene clusters, often called gene cassettes. And these gene cassettes or clusters move as a unit from one piece of DNA to another. So in this case, the integrase enzyme enables the gene cassettes to integrate or accumulate within an integron. And in this way, a number of different antibiotic resistant genes can be transferred as a unit from one bacterium to another. And as we'll see in unit two, when our first topic is horizontal gene transfer, plasmids and conjugative transposons are very important in horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. So remember, we, as we learned earlier, horizontal gene transfer is a process in which an organism transfers genetic material to another organism that is not its offspring. And as we pointed out earlier, the ability of both the domain bacteria and the domain archaea to adapt to new environments as part of bacterial evolution most frequently results from the excess of multiple genes transferred during horizontal gene transfer, rather than alteration of single genes through mutation. Although mutation does play an important role in bacterial evolution, the most rapid method is horizontal gene transfer because a number of different genes are transmitted at one time from one bacterium to another. So it's horizontal gene transfer that's able to cause rather large scale changes in the bacterial genome. We're gonna see later on in unit three that there are multiple virulence genes called pathogenicity islands, for example, that are located on large unstable regions of the bacterial genome. And these pathogenicity islands can be transmitted to other bacteria by horizontal gene transfer. So horizontal gene transfer allows for the transfer of plasmids and or transposons from one bacterium to another. If those become an advantage, then they tend to stay and are selected for. But if those transferred genes have no selective advantage, then usually they're lost by deletion. Uh, there's only so much room for a bacterium to contain a genome and plasmids, and it has to stay the same size pretty much all the time. So genes that are not an advantage are eventually deleted. Now, one other little thing we're going to mention while we're talking about plasmids, we'll kind of insert it here, is that because bacteria are always taking in new DNA from horizontal gene transfer, or because they're being infected by bacteriophages, the viruses that only infect bacteria, bacteria have developed a system for removing viral nucleic acid or DNA from self-serving or harmful plasmids. And this represents really a type of adaptive immunity that bacteria have. And it's carried out by this rather long term of words called clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, which is a little hard to remember. And so they call that CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. -S by the way, a palindromic repeat uh, is a nucleic acid sequence uh, that is the same whether it's read it from one direction or the other direction, five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime, they are uh, read the same. And so these, this CRISPR sequ these CRISPR sequences are associated with proteins called Cas proteins, and the Cas proteins possess nuclease activity. So what this CRISPR-Cas system does is it targets specific foreign DNA sequences in bacteria, like maybe a plasmid that would be harmful to the bacterium or self-serving, or maybe viral nucleic acid from a bacteriophage, and it cuts it up for destruction by the nuclease. So bacteria have always used this CRISPR-Cas system uh, to protect themselves from harmful or self-serving plasmids and from bacterial viruses.
But when it was discovered how they did this, this became a new and very important tool for genome editing or recombinant DNA technology. So this application of the CRISPR-Cas technology is a very common tool now used by molecular biologists in genome editing or what we call recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering in a wide variety of cell types. And this CRISPR system is an RNA guided gene editing platform, making use of the Cas9 protein, a nuclease, and a synthetic guide of RNA to induce double-stranded breaks at a specific location in a genome. Because it's RNA guided, they can design that to cut, recognize a certain DNA base sequence in the genome and inter insert that CRISPR-Cas system right at that location and cut it at that specific location. So molecular biologies are now using this to carry out highly efficient targeted alterations of genome sequences. And they hope to eventually use that to repair damaged or dysfunctional genes. Now again, we're not gonna get into that in detail in this particular unit or in any of our units, but I did wanna mention that since it's a common technique now that you hear about in recombinant DNA technology. And if you're curious about it, there's a nice little movie here on genome editing with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. You can watch if you like. And finally, there's a self-quiz for our soft chalk lesson on plasmids and transposons.